Uh, and it's uh, unusual that we will be having a town hall meeting uh, midday. But I thought I'd start by explaining why the timing has shifted. First of all, just to get a sense, because I'm already explaining why things are different this time around. If I could just get a sense that for some of you, this is, if for anyone here who, for whom this is your first time coming to one of my town halls, oh, that's great. Okay, that's quite a few people. That, and can you hear me all right in the back? They're very bad. Can you hear all right? Not quite so well. Okay, well, we, we don't have a microphone, so I will project. And if you're having trouble hearing me, give me a sign of some kind. Or you can move closer. That's another thing. But I will project all the way to the very back. What we the town hall meetings, just for those of you who put your hands up, this is your first time. Uh, these meetings are nonpartisan. I try as hard as I can to keep them nonpartisan. In other words, they're not Green Party meetings at all. I'm your member of Parliament, and as I understand the job of a member of Parliament, it's to represent my constituents. The only job description for a member of Parliament found in any Canadian law is found in our Constitution. And all it says in the Constitution is members of Parliament represent constituencies. And because political parties aren't mentioned in our Constitution at all, because we actually don't need them, that's why the, the, the job of a member of Parliament, I believe, should be to represent constituents and work for them, not to push for your political party and not take, now I happen to be leader of my party, but none of the other MPs elected with the Green Party will ever have to take instructions from me because we believe the boss of an MP is always the constituents. So then when I got, a, during the election campaign four years ago, um, believing that this was the job, I did promise people in all my meetings that to make sure that I was touching base with the people for whom I work, I would hold town hall meetings. I didn't know then on what frequency I would do it, or, well, it worked out really well. I've lost track of how many I've had now. I think something like 80. But we have had every fall, between Labor Day and mid-September, when Parliament resumes, and we've reported in the fall of what happened in the spring session of Parliament, January to June. And in January, we've reported on what happened in the fall session, mid-September to, to Christmas, rather. And that timing seemed to work well, and we've held town hall meetings in nine locations twice a year. So four locations on the Saanich Peninsula, and all, one in, on each of the five Gulf Islands that I represent. So the goal of the town hall meeting is to report on what I've been doing and find out what's on your mind. Now, I and I help get all their immigration work done. We do a ton of work out of the MP office for constituents through all kinds of government bureaucracy. But these town hall meetings are going to tell you what's been going on in Ottawa. So, and then once I finish presenting roughly what happened over the last January till now, I'll open the floor for you to either ask more questions about those issues or raise anything else that's on your mind. So, nothing's off limits, but I'll. First, I'll start by giving you a sense of what I've been working on in Parliament. So in January, with that, oh, let me just summarize for fun some of the things that happened that were good. Why not get those out of the way? Um, <laughs> first, I should also acknowledge that we are meeting here today on Coast Salish territory and acknowledge that with gratitude. Since Parliament began in January, I've tabled two new private members' bills. One is an act to, to help small business across Canada. It would create under the uh, Minister of Industry an obligation to do an impact assessment of new legislation, new regulations, or fiscal policy for their impact on small business. So it's, a, it's an impact, a small business impact assessment act. It would be under the Minister of Industry to implement it. And it's, uh, it's received very nice reaction. I did, I did work on it in advance with the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and give them a chance to look at it. I hope to pursue working on it after the election. Another private member's bill I tabled calls for all federally funded science to be made public uh, as a mandatory decision. 
one stand against C51. And when I asked the question in question period, that, that very morning there had been a very good editorial in the Globe and Mail, the first newspaper to take an editorial stance against C51, in which the Globe and Mail editorial board described it as the secret police act. So I used that term in my question, which resulted in roars of heckling uh, that were so bad that I had to sit down. This is what I do. My, my policy of zero tolerance for heckling, many of you will know the policy I use, which is that not only do I never heckle in the House of Commons, but if I'm being heckled and can't hear myself think, I don't try to continue the question. I sit down, and almost always, the speaker rises, calls for order, and gives me back the floor. And that's one way I have been trying to promote uh, greater civility in Parliament. So my first question on this was fe uh, February 2nd, opposing C-51. It was and is an omnibus bill. There are five separate pieces of legislation inside C-51. It's called the Anti-Terrorism Act. But honestly, having learned a lot more about security and the nature of how you disrupt terrorist plots and what the function should be of an intelligence service or the function of an RCMP and all these different pieces of our security regime in Canada, I have to say I've learned a lot and I'm absolutely horrified by how much Canada stands alone in doing things badly. I mean, there, we have what are called the five eyes, you know, E-Y-E, five eyes partners of Canada for, uh, for intelligence and sharing that intelligence. And we work with the five eyes are Australia, New Zealand, of course Canada, the US and the UK. So all of our intelligence services share information with each other, at least in theory. But the five eyes, of, a, of the five eyes partners, Canada is the only one that has no oversight over what the spy agencies are doing, no parliamentary committee to keep an eye on what they're doing, no what's called pinnacle review. No one agency or person inside the government of Canada knows what each one of these different agencies are doing. So there's the RCMP, there's CSIS, there's CSEC, which is an odd one that stands for Communications Security Establishment Canada. It's the one that does the collection of metadata, of, of going through the internet and scooping millions of downloads and that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's also the Canadian Border Services Agency. And none of these agencies have anyone who knows what they're all doing, even though they all have a piece of observing, monitoring, and one would hope disrupting a terrorist plot. The key experts that I have come to know through this process all agree that C-51 will make us less secure against a possible terrorist attack because these different agencies don't report to each other, or share information with each other. And under C-51, this is what the Globe and Mail meant by secret police, we've taken CSIS, which was supposed to only be an intelligence gathering agency, and we have turned it into uh, uh, an agency empowered to go out and quote unquote disrupt plots, disrupt efforts to their threats to the security of Canada. But they're not required to tell anyone what they're doing. They're also able to give out immunity, promises of immunity, that if, if they're tracking someone that they think is a possible terrorist, they can say, well, if you work with us, being CSIS, we'll give you immunity from prosecution, or we'll make it, we'll give you a, a, an absolute commitment, a guarantee that you will never be called as a witness. Meanwhile, the RCMP can be monitoring these same people and counting on using that person as a witness. So it's really badly badly designed if you really want to have an anti-terrorism act. It is like a, uh, trying to figure out the right metaphor, it's like a cannonball through the heart of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It absolutely removes our rights to privacy in part one. It takes away our ability to be confident that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms will be there, that if someone's being targeted by CSIS in their efforts, the bill creates the only such provision anywhere in any democratic society, which is the ability of CSIS, now empowered to go out and disrupt plots, to go to a federal court 
judge in a secret hearing to get a warrant to break domestic law and or to violate charter rights with no public report of how this is going on, no, super, no supervision. So it's a deeply anti-democratic piece of legislation. And the, the horrible news is that it passed the House, it passed the Senate, and it just yesterday received royal assent. So it's now law. So I believe we're going to have to repeal it because even with all the court hearings that are likely to happen challenging it, it represents a threat. A lot of that secret hearing piece is very unlikely to form a proper case where someone would have standing to challenge it because it's all so secret. It'd be very hard to show how it's disrupted and offended the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because there's no public reporting of what they've done. So skipping away from that for a moment, um, one good piece of news, I did get some amendments passed to the Pipeline Safety Act. Two of my amendments were accepted, which is not just almost never happens for me, it almost never happens for any opposition party. But the Pipeline Safety Act is not actually an act about pipeline safety. It's an act about liability for accidents for pipelines. <laughs> so what it does is it says, in the event of, it was supposed to say, in the event of a pipeline spill, the minister said, in the event of a spill, this bill says the polluter pays. Well, when the bill went to, through Parliament, when, it, when I read it, what it actually said is, this makes it possible for the polluter maybe to pay, because it creates a possibility that the government can go after the polluter after a spill. So I, I put forward an amendment, very obvious change, from the minister may seek indemnification and compensation from the pipeline company, to the minister shall. And my amazement, the conservatives on the committee voted for my amendment, and the minister told me he liked it, so it went into the new law. The other piece that, was, that I felt good about was that it set out that municipalities and provinces that had had expenses incurred because of pipeline spill, that they could go after the polluter. And I added to that, so can First Nations. So this, this, was, this was great because it, it did go through and it is law and it improved an act. I, I still don't think it should be called the Pipeline Safety Act, but I did manage to improve it, which is almost unheard of in our current parliament to accept opposition party and amendments, and I have no idea why they took my amendments. I really don't <laughs> But, that, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so other big issues. There was the vote on the extension of the bombing mission. It was supposed to be a six-month mission of bombing in Iraq. It's now extended for a full year, bombing in Iraq and Syria. In order to get through this in 20 minutes, I'm just going to slide by that one off because I'm very concerned. I voted against it. Uh, and it will, in the, in the budget that was announced, uh, well, that's my next point is to say the budget was very late this year. Our budget came down April 21st because the Minister of Finance, Joe Oliver, postponed it. He said because he wanted to figure out how to balance the budget in the face of a falling price of a barrel of oil. Uh, the, the results, of, though, in terms of the budget, it's about $360 million that put in there for the military campaign in Iraq and Syria. Now, the rest of the budget, climate change wasn't mentioned anywhere in the budget. Uh, other areas that I, I find astonishing are no longer even mentioned are overseas development assistance. I mean, it was interesting to see Bono met with uh, Stephen Harper on Monday. But the idea of make poverty history globally, you kind of want to know what's in the envelope for what used to be CETA. I, I, I don't know if you all know this, but Stephen Harper has eliminated CETA, and it's now a part of foreign affairs, so it's not a separate agency. They now call it the part, we used to call it the department, years ago it was external affairs. Then it went to foreign affairs and international trade, DFATE, and it's now DFATD. So it's part of foreign affairs, trade, and development. So that's de facto. So there, there was no mention of overseas development assistance in, the, in what's called the budget, and there was no budget for it either. Uh, just to save time of telling you what isn't in the federal budget, when the Minister of Finance tables it over the last number of years, the budget that's tabled in the spring, the document called a budget, does not contain a budget. <laughs> it, I, I think they should call it the annual spring thick brochure. <laughs> it's thick, and it contains many announcements of spending. 
But what's missing is knowing, okay, I'll just use the example of the Iraq and Syria money. $360 million. Well, you don't know, is that new money to the Department of National Defense? Is that pulled from somewhere else in national defense? Is the overall budget for national defense going down or up or staying the same? There's no way to know from reading the budget because it doesn't contain a budget. Our former parliamentary budget officer, Kevin Page, made note of this actually in this very room when he spoke here, sponsored by my local riding association. And he said one of the principles of Westminster parliamentary democracy is that parliament controls the public purse. And he said this is no longer the case, this is quite true, because no parliamentarian knows enough about the budget to vote on it before we vote. Because you can't, you, you don't know until you've read all the main estimates, which come out quite separately and often weeks or months later. And then you need the supplementary estimates to really know what a department is spending. And even then you don't know because it does appear strange that a number of initiatives that are announced find out at the end of the year actually no money has been spent under those big announcements. So it's announced that we're going to spend money on whatever. And then it turns out that it never actually got spent. So keeping track of a real budget is, is one of my goals. Is, is there was a provision in one of the omnibus budget bills when the Conservatives had a minority parliament to allow billions of dollars of spending every year to be under a provision that they'd be deemed to have been studied, but they didn't really need to be studied. And we have to get rid of that. Uh, one of the people who lambasted that, if you want to Google and get good analysis, it said, was a former senator. He had to retire because he hit 75. He didn't have to retire because he was going to jail. He actually retired because he hit 75. <laughs> uh, uh, former progressive conservative senator Lowell Murray was the one who was apoplectic in the Senate, trying to stop this deeming provision. Because by that point, it had gone through the House, but well, I wasn't elected yet. So it, it had gone through the House without anybody noticing it. And Lowell Murray was blowing a whistle on it in the Senate. Anyway, back to what else happened this spring. Okay, so as I mentioned, we had the budget April 21st, followed very quickly by what has become common, and I hope never happens again, an omnibus budget bill. Now, the omnibus budget bill this year was Bill C-59, and it contained, again, many separate provisions with nothing to do with the budget. There were 20 separate bills affected by the spring omnibus budget bill uh, relating to uh, interns, relating to, oh, one of the ones that came up with the public concern from, this, the, from the, uh, the Privacy Commissioner for the Government of Canada is collection of biometric information. I put forward an amendment to try to, I put forward zillions of amendments to C-59 to try to fix it, but one of them was to make sure that, the, that collecting, for instance, fingerprints and iris readings, the way the bill is drafted, could apply to their new law, C-45, C back in fall of 2012, changed the permit system for foreigners coming to Canada for vacation. This has gotten very little attention. Of course, I noticed it right away because I, I grew up in the tourist industry, in the tourist business. They changed it back in C45, and they're only implementing it now, that people who live in countries that currently do not require a visa to come to Canada will be required to apply online to the Minister of Immigration for permission to come here on vacation. And the way I read C-59, the omnibus budget bill, the collection of biometric information could apply to people who want to come here as tourists. I think this will announce that the exception of countries that do not require a visa to visit Canada, the only country that will not be required to apply online to the Minister of Immigration are residents of the United States because they're exempted through agreements in the Security Prosperity Partnership for trying to create a security perimeter around the US, Mexico, and Canada. But, I mean, I, I'm very worried about the tourist industry, you may know this, because we've, we've dropped in the last number of years from being the seventh most visited country in the world to the 18th. And I think part of the reason is we've stopped advertising and our 
eliminated the rebate that tourists used to get for any GST, HST they spent here. And there's been a series of decisions that undermine tourism. That was, by the way, my only victory in the spring 2015 budget was that I had my pre-budget consultation with Joe Oliver. And it's the first time since I became a member of Parliament that my pre-budget consultation with Finance Canada was actually with the minister. Every year I've prepared submissions. And I usually only meet with Finance Canada bureaucrats. But I spent well, like at least 40 minutes with Joe Oliver. And one of the things I pushed hard was the US is our biggest tourist market. Tourism employs over 600,000 Canadians. It's about 3% of our GDP, or 1% more than the oil sand. And on top of that, when our dollar is an 80 cent dollar, it's a sector that stands to gain from our current low dollar. So we should be advertising like crazy in the US market because we know the value of our dollar versus the US dollar, but most people in the States don't. We need to advertise that this is the year for them to come to Canada. So Joe Oliver did put in the budget a commitment to advertising in the US, but the budget says we don't have a dollar amount yet because we need to consult more with the tourism industry. So I'm afraid they're gonna, they've missed the 2015 summer season, but with any luck, there'll be some money and some effort soon. Okay, so that gets us through most of what was in C-59. I saved the worst for last. There are 20 different bills there, so I'm not gonna go through all of them. But the one that was the worst is one you may have seen in the news because the Commissioner for Access to Information, Suzanne Legault, has done quite a bit of media attacking this one. What C-59 does is magic away offenses committed by the RCMP in destroying data. So Suzanne Legault was very concerned as, our, as an officer of Parliament that the RCMP, well before the bill to eliminate the long gun registry had passed, was destroying data collected on the long gun registry. I'm watching people back up here. So can you hear me now? I've got to remember to keep talking up for you. So the, the destruction of long gun registry information violates access to information law. Suzanne Legault, as Information Commissioner, began to press the administration early that there was a crime that had happened and she wanted it prosecuted. She actually wrote to the Minister of Public Safety at the time, and this was some years ago, because the minister was Vic Caves, who's no longer in federal politics. Vic Caves gave her a written undertaking that the RCMP would not destroy data. But then it appears they did anyway. So here's what's happened. Bill C-59 goes back to the date when the bill to eliminate the long gun registry went to first reading, not to when it was passed, and says the access to information laws did not apply from that date forward. Now what Suzanne Legault says is, imagine if you will that the election laws are violated. And after an election, a majority government says, oh, those laws you thought we broke, they don't exist anymore. So post facto, retroactive elimination of laws you've already broken is a pretty dangerous precedent. What Stephen Harper said in the House was, we were just closing a loophole. The Parliament of Canada has the will to get rid of the long gun registry. And the RCMP are merely doing what the Parliament of Canada wants. Starting with, apparently, at first reading, as opposed to when the bill passed. What Suzanne Legault said, I think she's very brave, she said, look, this is a quote, this, is, this wasn't to close a loophole, this creates a black hole. <laughs> so I think she's quite brave. So that, unfortunately, C-59 did go through the House of Commons, Last week, uh, it hasn't yet gone through the Senate all the way, but, um, and we'll see if the Senate is likely to push that through before they rise for the summer. We, we rose yesterday. Uh, Parliament will resume whenever the election is over. I'll just touch briefly on it, if I can, making sure I haven't gone too long. The climate developments the last few months, they didn't happen in the House of Commons, but they are significant. 
in that we are going to be negotiating in a deadline context a comprehensive new climate treaty at a conference that starts November 30th. It's the 21st Conference of the Parties on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we have been meeting several times a year, but with the big Conference of the Parties once a year, every year. And I'm the only member of Parliament who's gone for years, other than the Minister of Environment. This conference needs all parties to be much more ambitious than they're currently being, by parties I mean countries. But Canada's been about the worst. We missed the deadline. We were supposed to place our new targets with the UN within the first quarter of 2015, so by March 31st, but we didn't. Fortunately, the G7 meeting this year was held in Germany. And I say fortunately because the chair of the meeting controls the agenda. If the meeting had been in Canada, we would not have seen climate change on the agenda. But because Angela Merkel was chairing the meeting, they've been working for months on a communique that would say, we agree as the most, well, the wealthiest industrialized countries on earth in the G7 agree that we have to get off fossil fuels altogether and be substantially there by 2050. And the word used for off fossil fuels is decarbonization. We're on a decarbonization agenda. And it was clear, I first heard about the communique and Harper's reaction to it a couple months ago, because it was well before, if any of you ever worked in foreign affairs and you're retired here, you'll know that a communique like that for the G7 is mostly drafted well before the meeting starts. So they've been arguing over decarbonization for some time. Canada only agreed to use the word decarbonization if we eliminated reference to 2050 and said we'll be at decarbonization by 2100. Now even with that target being 85 years out, the PMO spokespeople further refined it to say that's merely an aspirational target. <laughs> 85 years out. The, but because of the G7 focusing on climate, that meant Canada did not want to sense, well, Stephen Harper didn't want to show up in Germany with no climate target. We didn't submit it by March 31st, which we were supposed to, but Leona Azulukak, Minister of Environment, released it on the Friday afternoon of the long May weekend, which is always a hint that they're really proud of it. Uh, <laughs> but the, the new target is the weakest in the G7. It's 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, plus or minus a percentage point, that's pretty much Barack Obama's target, but for 2025. So we are lower, lower targets, less ambition later, and we're prepared to say we'll be off fossil fuels maybe in 85 years. I'm very impressed, by the way, by the latest thing to come along to try to create momentum and incentive for the Paris Conference, and that comes from uh, His Holiness Pope Francis, who has written, and, it, and, and he, of course, he didn't hold the pen by himself. I think, from what I'm reading, a lot of scientists were involved, a lot of bishops were involved, a lot of non-Catholics in other faith groups were involved because he wanted it to be a real in, a message to the world. And I do think, he, with, I, I just wrote a blog about it, so I won't get into all the details. There's things, of course, that I will not agree with the Vatican forever. But this is worth reading. I just want to signal that to people. Just, it's, a, it's a significant challenge to our culture, which, as well as a demand for going off fossil fuels rapidly. OK, I'm going to stop there um, and, and open the floor to questions. Uh, we, and because, as I mentioned, we don't have uh, Mike's here, that's fine, I think we're fine. It's a, it's a lecture hall, it's got good acoustics. But I will repeat your question to make sure everybody hears it. And thanks again for coming on such a gorgeous Saturday. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. I need to commend you for the work you've done. I think you're perhaps one of the best things. Also, sadly, I will be leaving your writing oh. because I go to Esquire House. Saturday soon. Saturday soon. Because I'm on the west side of the park. But let's hope you're not leaving my coffin. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have a number of questions, and I'm quite sure there are a lot of others who want to ask you questions. But I'll ask you one, and if you allow me, maybe two. Uh, what happened in South Carolina on Wednesday? A friend of mine commented that all Muslims must be feeling a sigh of relief. It was the white 
would have been a terrorist. White, young man, you not a crazy guy. So I just want your reflection. And if you're looking for the second question, it might be a simple, simpler one. I want your reflection on the NDP victory in Alberta and how that will impact Canada in terms of trade relations and economy. Well, two very interesting questions and entirely different from each other. And I'll try to approach the second one in a nonpartisan fashion as well. Look, I couldn't agree with you more that there's a very different treatment in the media depending on if someone is a Muslim attacker and has committed a violent act and a non-Muslim. And it's very disturbing to me and I think it's disturbing to many people. We have our own example of this within Canada. And we know exactly how the conservative cabinet ministers responded to a, remember the, the plot to, to kill people in, uh, just in, in regional Halifax and Dartmouth in the Big Mac Mall. I remember if you heard about this? Yeah. And it, it was, thank goodness, the RCMP disrupt found out about this. They were communicating over internet. People came up from the US, some neo-Nazi white supremacists came up from the US to join uh, some disaffected and uh, disgraceful Nova Scotians who felt that they were drawn to white supremacy and they made links over internet. And I think it was basically, as what I remember, the facts of this case, some of their friends called the cops and said, they've gone crazy and they think they're going to kill people at Micmac Mall, you've got to stop them. And Peter McKay was asked if this was a terrorist plot. And he said, no, because there wasn't a cultural motivation. <laughs> now, I don't know why white supremacists and Nazis are a class apart from terror. This, this horror, I mean, my family background, my grandfather was from Charleston, South Carolina, and I know that church, and I know that community, and it's, it's unbearable. I mean, especially when I, I thought at first, I don't know why it makes any difference, but when I realized that young man had been sitting with them in Bible study, and that they had been sharing with him and opening their hearts to him, and then he felt that it's a more cold-blooded, horrific murder somehow than almost anything I've I mean, it's just awful, and, it, and dear old grannies there, and sweet, dear people who would open their, that's the thing, is they probably saw him and thought, well, this poor white kid is here at our black church. He seems lost, poor soul. I mean, they were helping him, and then he murdered them. But you're right, if it had been, if it had been uh, not a white killer, if it had been an Islamic uh, disaffected youth of the same, mental illness pattern drawn to the wrong craziness, he would have been described as a terrorist as opposed to someone who was just deeply disturbed. How does that affect Canada? How does it, well I said we had the same thing happen around the, the Micmac Mall thing. I think it means in terms of Bill C-51, which we've been debating a lot in Parliament, we've also, we've had a lot of rhetoric aimed at the Muslim community. And the, I don't know how many of you saw probably the low point of everything I've ever witnessed in Parliament in the last four years was last week was when the Liberal, Ralph Goodale, said, and I don't think he was out of line, he said, look, whenever we ask a question about terrorists, the response from the Conservatives is to start talking about the Muslim community. But we're talking about terrorists overall, and you always respond, and Chris Alexander, was Minister of Immigration, stood up and said, you're the racist party. You've been racist forever. Oh yeah, oh, oh. you can find this exchange on YouTube. Because the next, it went on for a while and it was, I've never heard such heckling, it was the worst ever. And uh, the next person recognized by the Speaker of the House was Peggy Nash, who's a friend of mine in the NDP. And the Speaker then re recognized the Honourable Member for um, Toronto High Park. And after that exchange, Peggy <laughs> started by just saying, Whoa! <laughs> like I've never heard anyone start a question. The question from we were speechless. It was the worst. It was really low. The other example of that I would say is, is the, the attempt to make the uh, face covering in a citizenship ceremony an issue. Yes. He said the niqab is an issue. In the dying days of Parliament, as in yesterday, they put forward a new bill to make it illegal to have your face covered in a citizenship ceremony. Now, the, the NICAB case that went to court was because uh, Jason Kenney had, without any judicial authority or legislative authority as Minister of Immigration, created a guideline which he sent out to all citizenship judges to 
say no one should have their face covered during a citizenship ceremony. People thought it was a charter case when the court struck that down, but it wasn't a charter case. The judge looked at it and said, the Minister of Immigration has no authority to issue that dictate. Moreover, the guidance for citizenship ceremonies that has been passed by Parliament says that members of people, that, that new Canadians coming to their citizenship ceremony, and I don't know how many of you have ever been to a citizenship ceremony, but they're beautiful. And they're particularly beautiful because the act says new Canadians coming to their citizenship ceremony are encouraged to wear their national costumes if they want to. So you have a kind of a rainbow array of beautiful young men from Africa wearing their traditional garb, and you've got people coming from uh, Eastern Europe wearing their traditional, you know, it's beautiful. And this young woman, this woman, she had a young woman, she's a professional and certainly took the case to court, she wore a niqab. And in the House of Commons, once the court ruled that you couldn't tell her she couldn't take her citizenship oath while wearing her niqab, uh, Harper said, what you, I mean, this culture is, he said, quite frankly, anti-women. Now this again is stirring things up against one particular culture. Now the worst example of this, I think I, I skipped over it telling about the act that went through Parliament this year, but I worked on a lot, is an act which is now passed the House of Commons. If you've never heard of this act, I'm glad you're all sitting down because you would faint to think that we have legislation. This is the title. Zero Tolerance for a Barbaric Cultural Practices Act. <laughs> Now you might wonder what, it, what, what possibly they're taking aim at here. If you think it's the residential school system, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act makes it illegal in this country to have honor killings. And conservatives have stood up in the House and said, if you don't think, you opposition members of parliament, that honor killings are not barbaric, they are a barbaric cultural practice, to which I keep pointing out to them. Killing was always illegal. <laughs> Murder is pretty much the definition of always illegal. Since Moses got the tablets, always illegal. <laughs> but they are stirred up as though our country was a wild west of honor killings without punishment because we had not taken a stand against this barbaric cultural practice of honor killing. So the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act also makes it illegal to force women into polygamous marriages. Number one, polygamous marriages, already illegal. <laughs> Forcing someone into a marriage is already illegal. Kidnapping someone to force them into a marriage, already illegal. Beating your daughter because she won't do what you say, already illegal. So again, it's stirring up cultural difference. It's incendiary language. It's deliberately uh, intended to push emotional hot buttons. And when we're in a context where there are reasons to be concerned about cultural difference, and I think sensible leadership says we need to create better cross-cultural dialogue. We need greater levels of understanding. We need to make sure that if there's a young Islamic youth who thinks this culture rejects them and wants to eliminate their culture, we need to reach out to them and say, no, that's not true, this is Canada. We've always been the most successful country on earth in welcoming cultural and ethnic diversity. So that's where I, I agree with you entirely. I, that's exactly a, a concern I have is that one group of people are being treated differently than others. And in the process, we may be missing, for instance, violent crime is going down across Canada. But one place where there are violent crimes is in drug, organized drugs, organized uh, crime around drug sales, and organized uh, gang crime. And because of the constant discussion of radical jihadi extremism, they are pulling RCMP officers off organized crime and gangs on the Lower Mainland to pull them onto the quest for jihadi extremists. So I think it actually undermines public safety to focus on one and miss the other. And gun crimes of any kind, and it, I'm so glad that this these uh, horrible uh, white supremacists in Nova Scotia, with they were they come well as I said most of them had come in from the U.S. but they made friends on the internet. I'm glad that obviously it was wonderful.
hardly relevant. Um, and certainly the ethnic origin should not be the main thing that attracts police attention. Now your other question about what does the election uh, of Alberta mean in trade relations, and I'm wondering if you're thinking about Keystone Pipeline or what aspect of trade. Uh, certainly uh, Rachel Notley, one thing Rachel Notley's victory shows is that when voter turnout increases, all bets are off. Now as bad as voter turnout was in Alberta, and it was only 58%, but that was the highest voter turnout in Alberta in 22 years. <laughs> in 2008, Alberta's provincial election, 2008, only 40% of Albertans voted. 60% stayed home. So when people in Alberta finally began to notice that it looked like the progressive conservatives under Jim Prentice had done so many things that offended so many people that the level of public anger was reaching territory that they had not seen before, people who hadn't voted for quite a long time decided to give it a try. So I think that's a very interesting conclusion. It certainly, she said that she will not push the Keystone Pipeline as hard as previous conservatives had. She's not against it, she's just not pushing it. She's not going to push Enbridge and Northern Gateway, but they are still pushing for Energy East and Kinder Morgan. And that aligns exactly with where the federal NDP is. So I don't think we'll see the federal NDP veer off that because they'll also want to keep their provincial cousins on the same page. But I do have hopes that perhaps we can get Alberta to adopt a much more progressive approach to climate change. Because, you know, I think, I think obviously, um, I, I, I only got to meet Rachel Knoxley for like 30 seconds. We were trying to get a meeting when I was in Edmonton for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities meeting. Because there is a path for Alberta to reduce its greenhouse gases dramatically and fast, and it's shutting down coal-fired power. So the electricity in Alberta is generated by coal-fired power, and there's just as many greenhouse gases in Alberta created by their electricity generating sector as by the oil sector. So the fastest route for them to get to start building, and, and then I think once we're past that hurdle, we can have national energy plans national climate plans and not be tiptoeing around Alberta as though it's a problem. Alberta has to be part of the solution. And it's, it, they've, got the, they've got the capacity there to make the changes. So you are next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just there's a bill, private member's bill, went uh, through to the Senate and it basically limited the PMO office's um, power. What ever happened to that bill? This, is, this was a bill put forward in the House by Michael Chong, conservative member from Wellington Halton Hill. The first version of that bill he showed me years ago, and it was actually why I didn't take my private member's bill to the same effect. I, I, I put my Lyme disease bill through, I had one or the other, and I knew Michael was bringing his bill forward, and I thought he'd have a better chance than me. The things his bill did at first reading, it no longer does. At first reading, his bill did what mine did, which is to say that under the Elections Act right now, the leader of federal political parties has to sign the nomination papers for every candidate, which has only been the law of the land since 1970, which for those of you who are young, and there are some young ones in the room, sounds like the Stone Age anyway, but 1970 to me is fairly recently. And when they made that change, and it was because they never had before on the ballot in Canada shown the political party next to the name of the candidate. So for instance, in Quebec, apparently, particularly Quebec, they would have several candidates with the same name. Pierre Leblanc versus Pierre Leblanc, and you wouldn't know which one was which, and how do you know on the ballot? So they decided to add the name of the political party next to the candidate. But then they said, well, how are we gonna know this person is really who they say they are? So they decided, okay, we'll have to have the leader of the party sign off that this person has the support of the party. And they accidentally created a great big club of threat that the leader of all the parties can say, well, if you don't do what I tell you, I'm not going to let you run. I'll pull your nomination papers. By the way, sure, forgive me. I'm going to digress from my own digression to say that we recently saw the story in the media about Senator Don Meredith. Okay. Don Meredith's political trajectory started when Stephen Harper decided he did not like the democratically nominated candidate for the Conservatives in the Toronto Centre by election. This was the by-election where Bob Ray won his seat. I think it was 2010, but I could be wrong. It could have been 2009 when Bob Ray got back in the House of Commons. But in that by-election, the Conservatives in Toronto Centre had nominated a guy named Mark Warner. He's a black lawyer in the community who refused to do something that the Conservative hierarchy demanded. Here's what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to remove from his website and from his CV his involvement in the fight on HIV AIDS. They wanted him to remove from his CV that he attended
attend the World AIDS Congress. And he refused to remove those things from his website because the, the leader of the party gets to sign the nomination papers. They pulled him as a candidate and they put Don Meredith in instead. And then Don Meredith's reward, he came in fourth in that by-election. The Green Party candidate came in far ahead. But of him, not ahead of Bob Ray. Then Don Meredith went to the Senate. So this is pretty fundamental to democracy that the leader of the party should not have the power to pull somebody unilaterally against the wishes of the people of their party. This is where the Reform Party came in. This was one of Preston Manning's fundamental points, that the people of the local riding association get to nominate their candidates. So that's what Michael Chong's bill would have done there. The other thing Michael Chong's bill would have done is to say that in all Westminster parliamentary democracies, when you think about this, you know it, but we don't think about it very much. And we're the same system of government as the UK. But the parliamentary caucus of a party can remove their leader. So Margaret Thatcher was defeated not by a general election in the UK, but when her caucus said, you're not our leader anymore. We're going to pick John Major. Same thing happened a couple times recently in Australia, from Julia Gillard to um, Rudd. Rudd, Kevin Rudd, and then back to Julia Gillard again. Oh, the other way around. Kevin Rudd to Julia Gillard, and then back to Kevin Rudd again. So what, what Michael's bill did was say, look, the parliamentary caucus, when there are X percent, and he changed the percent a few times to try to get people on board, can, can uh, create and demand a leadership review. So they wouldn't have the same, and we never changed our laws in Canada. It's only been a matter of convention and the way it's gone that we don't have this anymore, where a parliamentary caucus could say, gee, we've had enough of Jacques Chrétien, we're trying to get rid of him now, right? Parliamentary caucuses have been reduced in their power by the growth in power of organized political parties. And because leaders of Canadian parties in a system that apes the American system get elected in big, political party conventions, the constitution of the political parties, which is obviously not part of Canadian law, except that they're like private societies, says you can't replace a leader without going back to the membership. So Michael Chung's bill called the Reform Act would have done these things. To get everybody on side to get his bill to second reading to get it to committee, he had to water it down. Because neither the Liberals nor the NDP would take getting rid of the leader's signature. And obviously, it's hard to get the Conservatives to do it either. So his bill got so watered down that I have to say that by the time it got to third reading in Parliament, I didn't vote for it. I was torn about it because I like Michael, and I know that the bill overall might have done more good than harm, but because people saw it as the Reform Act, they might think it actually accomplished what it set out to do. It had gotten very compromised. All things being equal, I'd still like to see it get through the Senate. It's now been reported out of the Senate committee. It's for a vote before the whole Senate. It may have already passed, because I missed what happened last night in the Senate. I'll have to double check. I hope it passes before the Senate rises for the summer. I mean, even though I didn't vote for it, I knew it was going to pass in the House when I decided not to vote for it. I just got, and Michael was very sweet. He came over and I told him I wasn't going to vote for it anymore. And he said, look, people, I, and I said, you're not worried that you're not going to pass it. He said, no, we've got the votes to pass it. But he said, across Canada, you're the leader people look to for defending democracy. So if you don't vote for it, it won't look good for my bill. And I did promise him that if he was having troubles in the Senate, I'd try to help him get it through. So I have been trying. But that's what it is. That's what it would do. It was not so much focused on the PMO as on the political clout of every leader, regardless of whether they're prime minister or not. Susan. Can you talk a little about C24? C24 being the Pipeline Safety Act? Oh, the Oh, that's C24. Sorry about that. So C23 was quite by safety. C24, tiered citizenship is to say, well, there's a couple of different changes to citizenship that have come in under Harper. One is to say that if you've been overseas for a while, you can't vote. That one really worries me. So Canadian citizens typically, and a lot of Canadian citizens haven't lost their love of country to serve overseas. They may be for work reasons, or they may be career, or even as a diplomat, they may be overseas for quite a long time. So that's one change in citizenship, to say you can't vote. But the one you're talking about is where, uh, with the assumption that there are dual citizenships out there, that if you commit certain crimes, your citizenship can be stripped. Now, there is an international convention against statelessness. So no country can strip someone of citizenship 
and create essentially a, a, a global orphan who has no citizenship home. But if they can make the case that there's any claim whatsoever of dual citizenship, they can strip you of citizenship if you have been convicted of a certain number of crimes, particularly terrorist crimes. Our view is you should, citizenship is citizenship is citizenship. And we've never had provisions of stripping someone of citizenship. We've said if you're, convict, if you're convicted of a crime, you go to jail. You stay in jail, but you're still a citizen. So I think this is a very slippery slope and not a good idea. Especially since people now increasingly are being told they're dual citizenships of countries that they didn't know they were a dual citizen of. So how did it sort of put these and sneak up? And there it was. I mean, I never saw anything about it. And as a dual citizen, my children are dual citizens. Yeah. And even if they weren't, they really are, right? Yeah. Because of who I am. We have debated it in the House. I mean, it didn't get a lot of media coverage. It's one I should have talked about because I did put amendments forward on that one as well. Uh, I regard it as very dangerous because it does politicize citizenship. It makes it a very loosey-goosey concept. Instead of you're a citizen, you have your passport, that's your citizenship. You're not changing that. That's not a mutable concept. And it shouldn't be susceptible to an ideological rejection of something that you've done. If you've done something wrong and you have to pay your time, you go to jail. There's also, I mean, they've treated citizens very differently for years now. For instance, uh, Canadian citizens on death row in the U.S. always have the full force of Cana uh, Canadian diplomacy to get them removed from death row because Canada does not approve of capital punishment. We don't have capital punishment. So previous prime ministers would always go to bat for even, you know, cold-blooded murderers. But if they were on death row in the U.S., we want them to serve their term here. There's a lot of this kind of incredible punitive stuff. There's another one about um, basically throwing away the key. Life means life provision. The worst serial killers, murderers in Canadian jails, like, a, 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 well, they're never going to get out. A judge is going to look, perhaps, at the possibility of parole, but if someone's serving consecutive terms for brutal murders, and there, there are certain people who are just never getting out of jail. But for political reasons, they've brought forward this very much at the last minute, life means life, as though our judges are lenient, our jails are revolving doors, and we know that really isn't the case. Can anything slip in more to this bill? I mean, I know that it's set up term, but my, my oh. the slippery slope thing is exactly what I was See, we're going to have to repeal a lot of legislation, because as long as it's on the books that citizenship is a mutable concept, there are risks. And I think it's much more appropriate to ensure that people understand that citizenship also implies rights and responsibilities, that we understand citizenship. I mean, it plays both ways. If you start saying your citizenship is something we can take away from you, we don't want people to devalue citizenship. It's a huge commitment to a country. And it's a commitment that goes both ways. It gives you rights, it also gives you responsibilities and duties. And if somebody breaks the law overseas or breaks the law in Canada, we shouldn't have the right to say, okay, we're stripping you of citizenship and sending you back to wherever you were from. Even for people who have been born here, but through other acts, as you point out, your own kids, could be considered dual citizens. Yes? Yeah. 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 Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll limit myself to one clarification and one question. Clarification on C-59, it has to go through the Senate. When does the Senate recess and can it possibly get oil sent since Parliament is recessed, so you know, I'm hoping that that can't get passed. Uh, it probably will pass because they want it to pass. They've gotten it through the House now. It's before the Senate. Oh, there's a hand up in the back. About. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. I'm hearing it down here, and I forgot my promise to repeat questions. Thank you. The question is about omnibus budget bill C-59. It's now. So the question is, it's gone through the House. But can it possibly get through the Senate? And with the House adjourned, can it possibly get royal assent? And so that's, I mean, the answer is, unfortunately, it will probably pass the Senate because they won't let the Senate rise till they get through all the things they care about. They care about this one. By the way, this last session of Parliament broke all the records historically in Canada ever for applying time limits on debates, time allocation on debates. So it, when I say they want this bill passed, we know they want it passed because they apply time allocation on 
second reading on time and committee, on our clause by clause work, on report stage, on third reading. They pushed it through fast. I forgot to say one thing about the well, there's a lot I can say about 259. Another provision that I think is unconstitutional is putting the RCMP in charge of Hill security. Because going back to 1500, the Speaker of the House is in charge of the security of members of Parliament, not the government of the day, for good reason. So they've changed that, and now that the RCMP will be put in charge of House of Commons and Senate security. This was all pushed through without adequate study. I know they want it through. The Senate has not risen for the summer yet, and I expect the Senate will not rise till they push this through. And royal assent comes from Rideau Hall and doesn't require that we're in session. Okay, and my question is, if because of the Kinder Morgan pipeline there is a disaster spill on the coast, who has liability? Because Kinder Morgan has said, hey, not our responsibility, it's our pipeline. Once it gets in the water, it's not our problem. So, you know, who has liability? Okay. The taxpayer? So the, the follow-up question, which is I think different, is what I don't think, but if there is a disaster spill on our coast from a kinder market, the pipeline delivers bitumen mixed with xylilin to Vancouver, and if there's a spill of that material once a tanker has left port, who is liable? And the answer is the tanker company, not kinder market. And most, I found out recently that most, at least in the case of super tankers, they, and they're mostly flying under foreign flag, they are each one separately incorporated so that they can go bankrupt and not be liable. So the, the now I'm not sure about the Aframax size tanker, because the <coughs> Aframax tankers are the size that collects the bitumen and diluent from the port of Vancouver. But to have the huge expansion of that traffic that the Kinder Morgan expansion would create. I'm still, by the way, intervening in the Kinder Morgan pipeline process. A lot of people have withdrawn, notably Robin Allen, who's a brilliant economist. She has been part of that pipeline, and she wrote a brilliant letter for why she was withdrawing from the National Energy Board Review, because she said it was clear from the way the board was handling the evidence that they'd already made up their mind and it was a biased process. I'm staying in it largely because I've already retained a Toronto lawyer, Clayton Ruby, so we can sue them when it's over for a violation of the rules of natural justice, unless they allow me to do oral cross-examination of the expert witnesses from, kin from the National Energy Board, from, from Kinder Morgan. So back to the liability issue. There are international rules for liability for spills at sea through Maripol. Uh, we did have already passed last year a bill that created uh, a collection of money to a shared fund for tanker spills. Uh, and that is, that is to be in compliance with a global treaty that deals with spills of hazardous materials at sea. But it's, uh, that's, but again, it's not meaningful if the individual tankers are separately incorporated and can declare bankruptcy and walk away from the spill. Of course, the bitumen and diluent spill we have no actual knowledge of what that does in a marine environment. We know from the bitumen, diluent, Enbridge spill in the uh, Kalamazoo River in Michigan that it did not behave like crude. It behaved differently. And it, it has been virtually impossible to clean up. I mean, they still haven't cleaned it up, and it's been here. And it topped $1 billion uh, in, in the Kalamazoo River, the cost of trying to clean it up. So the answer would be the taxpayer. The answer for who would clean it up? Yes, the answer would be the taxpayer. Yeah, Irene. I mean, and Catherine, <laughs> calling yeah. her her mother's name. Goodness knows, Catherine. Right. And she's an honorable woman, too. She's very. <laughs>
of, of being not part of the tenant. Uh, I was, thought it was unfortunate that it got modified 85 years from now. I don't expect to be around. But um, I am concerned as to what will go along with that policy and promotion of it that addresses the autocratic government and lifestyle in the Middle East that is entirely dependent on oil. Okay, so I'm going to repeat everything Catherine just said. First of all, she saw in the paper this morning that she thinks that Michael Chong's bill did get through the Senate, but with deletions. So I have to go back and check because if they made any changes at all, that means it doesn't pass before the election and they'll have to go back to the House of Commons and start over again there. That's what the Senate should have done, by the way, with C-51. Make amendments, make changes, send it back to the House, and then it wouldn't have been law, but they did to Michael Chong's bill. The second part of her comments were and questions was about the, uh, being very pleased with what the G7 did with Angela Merkel as host and pushing for climate action and having this goal I mentioned earlier of decarbonizing by 2100, 85 years from now. Uh, and the question was how does this affect the, the, the culture and the oil dependency of countries in the Middle East? And the, all the conflict that we see and there. The What's and that has an impact on the whole world. Yeah. What's interesting to me is that in the climate negotiations, the Middle East have not been the stickler they once were. When the Kyoto Protocol was wrapped through, the gamble wrapped through the Kyoto Protocol, and under UN consensus-based decision-making, if any one country has put up its flag, which in UN terms, picture the UN and you've got all those guys sitting on their desks, a flag is just a folded over piece, it's got the name of the country, they put the name of the country up like this, and that signifies they want to speak, and it's very visible. The gavel went down on Kyoto with Saudi Arabia flag up, and the chair pretending he didn't see it. Kyoto Protocol went through. Now, what's interesting is that in the negotiations I've been attending since Copenhagen, the, the Saudi Arabia is not in the way. They seem to be, now, to be naive about this, but there's an awful lot of investment in Dubai and elsewhere in solar. I think they're actually seeing, they're not as, uh, they're not as intransigent in stopping negotiations as Canada has been. Uh, so I don't know whether they're really ready to make the transition or whether they're counting on countries like Canada and Australia to uh, monkey wrench the negotiations so they don't have to show themselves. But I, I had a remarkable conversation, which I will shout out to you, I suppose. When, um, in, at the negotiations I attended in Warsaw at COP19, so that was December of 2013, and in order to attend climate negotiations, since the Conservatives have taken the quite unprecedented view that when Canada goes to international negotiations, we go as the Conservative Party, and we do not include MPs from any other party. And that's never been the case before. I remember clearly, well, I've been to a ton of UN negotiations before I went to politics, where it would be, the, you know, you have all the opposition MPs plus civil society groups. Anyway. The negotiations, uh, now Jim Prentice was one exception, to give him credit. When Jim Prentice was Minister of Environment for Canada, Canada's delegation to Copenhagen did include the NDP and the Liberals and the Bloc. Of course, I wasn't elected yet, so it didn't include us. But I was there on my own hook with the Global Greens. But to get in the back room to understand what's happening in the real negotiations, you need to be with a country. With a, that, that, so you're a party to the negotiations, and a party badge gets you into where the real discussions are happening. So that's just to explain why in Warsaw at COP19, I was with the delegation of Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> because they needed help. There were only three Afghanistani bureaucrat diplomats they, only one of them had good English. And the negotiations in the side rooms, despite the fact that the UN system has eight official languages and usually has translation for everything, the weird thing of negotiations is that the clusters, the hubs, and the back rooms, and when I say back rooms, it can be a room bigger than this, 
where everyone's hammering out one part of one aspect of what's supposed to go in the treaty. And it's all in English. So I had the Afghanistani delegation, and there's, they had, it, it's a long story, but anyway, I ended up with Afghanistan. <laughs> and I was in the room with the group called the G77 in China for the caucuses before the main meeting. I was with, for the first time in my life, and it was a real treat, because I'd always wondered, you know, if you're, if you're a Western uh, environmentalist, you always want to know what's been going on inside that room with what's called the G77 in China. You know, blondes don't get in. So <laughs> there I am with Afghanistan. And they were, I have to say, it was a treat to see how they really function. High order diplomacy because the G77 in China includes the poorest countries on earth, the least developed countries. It includes the low-lying island states with the most at risk from sea level rise. It includes India, China, and Brazil, huge growing economies that are polluting. And it includes the Arab states, Saudi Arabia. Right? So I had this weird conversation where the head of the Afghan delegation wanted me to meet a friend of his who was on the Saudi Arabian delegation. <laughs> and so I met this man in his lovely flowing robes, and he said, and you're a Canadian member of parliament. Yes. So when I met Ban Ki-moon, well, actually, Ban Ki-moon knew I was Canadian. He saw I had my Afghan, I said, I, he said, Afghanistan? I said, Yes, I know. I said, I'm an environmental refugee. That <laughs> <laughs> people got it right away. But anyway, I was there talking to the Saudi Arabian delegate, and he said, I want you to know that when your government came to me, he said, I'm on the Credentials Bureau, which in the, in the Kyoto Protocol, which means he was one of the top diplomats from anywhere in the world whose job was to make sure that the countries that had signed and ratified the convention, were there in good standing. So when Canada decided to leave Kyoto, the first step was to deliver a letter to give one year written notice that we were leaving. And they delivered it to this Saudi Arabian delegate. And he said, when, they, when your country came to me to leave, he said, I, I tried to talk them out of it. I told them it would hurt the convention, and I told them there are no penalties under the Kyoto Protocol. There's no reason to leave, even if you don't do your, even if you don't reach your target, even if you don't pick a new target. There's no reason for you to exit the Kyoto Protocol. I tried to explain to them, and of course I said I tried to tell them. I I know there's no penalties, up. so I must have been a bit emotional because he suddenly put his arm around me, and he said, "Don't worry," he said. We all know this isn't really Canada. <laughs> so, what are the chances, Catherine, that Saudi Arabia is more committed to climate action than Canada? It's kind of like, what are the chances the Vatican gets science? More than, I don't know. I, I could be wrong about what they're doing behind the scenes, but what I see in the room is that they're not walking in. They're not, you know, believe me, they're not great. <laughs> they're, they're trying to defend oil interests, but they haven't been practicing visible sabotage the way Canada has. It, it's just, it seems from afar that their economy has totally depended on oil. They have, and they have, it's interesting, it does seem from afar that their economies are totally dependent on oil. And I'm no fan of Saudi Arabia, by the way, having just told you that touching story. I think it's outrageous that we've sold them tanks. Mm -hmm. What they're doing right now in Yemen is an illegal war, and the situation in Yemen in terms of beheadings and, and potential failed state and refugee and humanitarian crisis. And we're not willing to separate ourselves from Saudi Arabia in terms of giving, selling the military aid. Although we realize that with our dollar falling, the tanks that Saudi Arabia bought from us, they saved about $3 billion on tanks when our dollar dropped in value, you know, because they're fake US dollars. Never mind. The, uh, the, uh, the selling of military hardware to Saudi Arabia is something that I don't think has gotten nearly enough attention to us. Anyway, next, yes. Yeah. Well, the situation for, the question is what do we do about CDC? I think the situation for public broadcasting requires a public commitment, which doesn't put it on the same playing field with commercial television. 
So the idea, well, CBC isn't holding on to its audience, so therefore we give it less money. Or CBC is an extravagance. We need CBC and Radio Canada as an aspect of protecting our culture, protecting democracy, protecting being able to tell each other our stories. We don't hang together as a country without shared information and actually shared narrative. So I think Peter Zosky in Morningside did more to bring Canadians together coast to coast to coast than anything for years. And if we lose CBC, and we're, I think we're really at risk of, well, you're sitting two seats down from Joanne Roberts. So now I'm going to have to say, <laughs>
concerned about the change of who's allowed to vote. It seems that they're trying to get rid of seniors, yeah. young people, and poor people. How can, how can we respond to that? The question was, her concern is about who is allowed to vote, and her impression is that they're trying, they being the current government, trying to get away from certain groups of people voting, making it harder for seniors to vote, young people to vote, poor people to vote, and a lot of First Nations. How about people with disabilities? People with disabilities. You can add along the, 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 what we call the, it was Bill C-23 in a previous session, the problem with numbers keep changing, you get new C-23s, but the, they called it the Fair Elections Act. I think most people call it the Unfair Elections Act. Did a couple of things that make it harder for people in those categories to vote. Now you might wonder why is it harder for seniors to vote, because that should be easy, and I think that's an unintended consequence of the law, is that if you've given up your driver's license, and that mostly affects us when we're seniors, there, you're gonna find it harder to vote, because you're gonna to have to prove who you are and where you live, and, this, and it has to be a government-issued photo ID. If, and, if, and I'm particularly worried about seniors because we're so used to knowing how to vote, go to the same polling station, we're very unlikely to be aware ahead of time to go early to make sure. So if you go on voting day and then you find you're, you're rejected and you have to go home and try to root around for paperwork, you might miss your chance to vote. That did happen to seniors in 2008 that I knew personally. So uh, that's one concern. And for young people, if you've moved from one, if you don't have, uh, if you've gone to university, for example, you want to vote where you are at university, you can have a driver's license that proves you are who you say you are, but if it's tied to your home address and you're in a new place to vote, you won't be allowed to vote unless you can also prove where you live now. So what we need to do, and I'm really urging people to take it seriously as a commitment, to help people by making sure that you find people who are in this category, and a lot of people who are homeless, it's gonna be a real challenge. But find people who are gonna be likely to find it harder to vote and bring them to the advance poll so that if there's something wrong with their paperwork, you've got fallback time to fix it. We need to get voter turnout to go up across Canada, and I think the best way is to use a buddy system. Bring, take it on as a little challenge, bring someone to the polls, and go to the advanced poll to make sure you can vote. I think so, so you were, one more question. Can I just, oh, add that question. But, um, the new British Columbia service card, which we all need to have uh, if we don't have a driver's license uh, for our health insurance, et cetera, uh, is photo issued ID with your address on it and is government issued ID. Yeah, that should work. For BC. For BC, oh, that should work. Yeah. So are these yeah. in your own constituency? But I don't have one of those yet myself, but I was. But you have a driver's license. I have my driver's license. Yeah. So any senior that doesn't have a That's driver's right. license but has a, a card to get their name in BC. So, so anybody else have any more questions? Or I can take one more, Susan says, and then we'll be at the 3 minutes. We have to get her to a fair. Oh, that's right. I have to get to a I forgot. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yes, sir.
She wasn't pronouncing the fucking.